brother. Great job, Jeremiah. Way to go, man, leading those songs. Appreciate your, your work in that. The only thing better than having a Jeremiah lead the church in, in one song is to have Jeremiah lead the church in an entire service. And I've had the, the blessing of being a part of that, too. I think it was last year or maybe two years. I lose track of that. But it was with the congregation uh, where his, his family uh, worships holding a meeting, and he did the whole service on one of our evenings. He did an excellent job in that, and he did an excellent job uh, today, too. It's always a treat to be with this congregation. I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation uh, to be a part of this lectureship, and I echo, I know what I'm sure many others have said and will continue to say, what an awesome theme that's been selected. How do you get any better than this one? <laughs> the lessons on, on the cross. I just feel sorry for the, the guys uh, who have to come up with the one next year, because I, I don't know if you can do better than what, what this theme is, the subject of, of the cross. Uh, speaking of, of which, uh, there's a, a song that goes, there are three wooden crosses at the right side of the highway. And that's a part of, of Randy Travis's famous song, and it continues a, a little uh, after that. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. Uh, I'm a little bit of a fan of Randy Travis uh, music. I like some country music. Uh, you might like him as well. I'm sure you've heard this song before. It's been around for many years and, and rightfully entitled Three Wooden Cl Crosses. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. As we cast our, our minds to Calvary and, and this entire theme, and, and once again in, in this lesson, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, ask us to allow ourselves to see the three crosses of that storied hill, and, and perhaps we can discover as the song suggests, why there were not four of them that were found there. Why were there three crosses that were found on Calvary's hill? We open in Luke chapter 23 and verse 32, where the Bible reads, there were also two other uh, male factors, this word just means criminals, led with him to be put to death. The hymn, of course, is Christ. And so you have Christ that's going to be punished, obviously, on one of the three crosses. Uh, now, obviously, with, with Jesus, it's not his fault that he's being punished. Uh, you know, just like in, in our time, back in the first century, too, there were times when there were people who were punished for crimes that they did not commit. Uh, sometimes that happens in our world today. Sometimes that still happens in the United States of America. It's never right whenever that occurs, but we find Jesus in that very spot. He's suffering for a crime that he did not commit. Now, what we see usually, thankfully, whether in our culture or even back in theirs, when people did suffer, it was actually for a crime that they did commit. And that's the case with these two guys. They're stated to be male factors or, or criminals, and that's the case because they've broken the law, and so they deserve to be punished for the crimes that they've committed. You know, there was a, a guy who was a pretty wealthy uh, individual, and you know how sometimes the law can be manipulated uh, with, with money and power, and this guy was accustomed to doing that. He, he had this, uh, his own lawyer set aside, and, and when anything came up, when he had another run-in with the law, he would call him, hey, I got this going on this time, what do you think I should do in this situation? Well, he'd done this 10, 12 times, and, and finally he calls the lawyer one day and said, Hey, I've got another problem here with, with the law. What legal advice do you have to give me? And finally the lawyer told him, Stop breaking the law. <laughs> That's pretty good advice, isn't it? <laughs> if you break the law, eventually you're going to have to pay for the crimes that you've committed. These guys have broken the law. And so they're paying for the crimes justly that they've committed. Now, there's one who hasn't committed any crime who's being treated unfairly, but these two guys, they're getting exactly what they deserve. But remember, there are three crosses and not just two on Calvary. We have to go to Mark chapter 15 to find this, and in verse 7, there was one of them named Barabbas. Now, this is the only guy of the three who's named, and I believe that is significant, as we'll show in just a moment. There was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him. Uh, the insurrection is a, a rebellion. Uh, a rebellion takes place against a, a government. Uh, they say curiosity kills the cat. And if that's the case, I probably ought to be dead by now, because I'm always curious, wanting to know more. <laughs> Uh, about something. You, you probably are like that as well. Uh, you know, if I'm a feline, maybe I'm on my ninth live. I might have to stop here. Uh, but I'm curious about this, aren't you? I'd like to know of what rebellion these three men 
were guilty. I, I want to be very clear in stating this. We're not directly told in the scriptures of what particular rebellion they were associated. I did some investigation into this, though, and, and I found a, a really interesting tidbit from history, and that's that during the, the reign of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, the famous first century historian Flavius Josephus records that there was a, an insurrection that came up among the Jewish people. And, and the reason for this, he states, is that Pilate determined that he needed to build a new aqueduct in Judea. The issue was he didn't have the money for it, but he knew where he could get it. And so he went to the Jewish treasury and he had the money extracted out from the temple treasury of the Jews. Now, how do you think the Jews felt about this? <laughs> Josephus also records that there was an uprising among the Jews that took place from this. Again, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying we know for certain this is the, the background of what took place, but it's really interesting that the time period fits and the characters fit. It could very well be that these three men were the rebels and trying to justify in their sight the wrong that the Roman government had done to them. It could as well be that the Jewish leaders hired them simply as, as their pawns, guys who are already criminals, <laughs> to carry out their dirty work for them. But whatever the exact circumstance was, these men had led a rebellion against the government. And whether you look at that civilly or you look at that religiously, folks, that's wrong to rebel against the government. They're criminals, and so they're going to be justly paid for their crimes. That's why there were three crosses on Calvary's hill for three criminals who deserved to be punished in the way that they were. But if you'll notice, there's one cross that stands out from the rest. The one cross in the middle. Why was there originally one cross found in the middle? Well, it goes back to the only guy of the three who's named John 18, verse 40, describes for us that Barabbas was a robber. And, of course, we're familiar enough with the count. We know that the other guys were exactly the same. But all three of them were thieves. This is what we know so far. They were thieves and they were rebels. I want to go back to Mark 15 and verse 7 and look at the fullness of it. We only considered the first portion a bit earlier. But verse 7 of Mark 15, its entirety states, And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him who had committed murder in the insurrection. In the rebellion, they stole and they committed murder. That's what we know about these guys. You know, it, it could be that these individuals didn't intend to do all of these things. It might be that they were just rebelling against the government. I would love to know, you know is it connected with what took place in, in Pilate's a pet water project <laughs> and if so from their standpoint are they simply trying to steal from the government back what originally belonged to them as they see in fairness it should be I would love to know do they murder a governmental official to try to get even with them I'd like to know even more did they have a bounty that was put on Pilate's head and maybe that's why he's so upset about this I realize that's some speculation. I'm not saying any of these things is so, but these are the three things that we know for sure. They're thieves, they are murderers, and they are rebels. And they all deserve to die for their crimes. And that's why three crosses were found. But there's one cross that stands out that's put in the middle. Why is that the case? And why is this man the only three who's named among the bunch? Matthew chapter 27 gives some more information. Matthew 27, verses 15 through 18. At that feast, that's of course the Jewish Passover, uh, around which Christ is about to give his life. At that Jewish feast, the Passover, the governor was wont, he was accustomed to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. I, I don't believe this is because Pilate's a particularly generous person or he just really loves the Jews. <laughs> He's a smart politician. Uh, what Pilate has done in this aqueduct project is he's taken what doesn't belong to him. The Jews aren't very happy about this. He's done it against their will, and a rebellion came forth from this. He's taken what rightly belongs to the people, 
But to try to keep peace with the people, every year he'll throw them a bone and something that, that might interest them. Does that sound like any kind of politics that you know? <laughs> Politicians taking from the people what they want, which may or may not be fair, comes election time, you know, what are you guys interested in? What would you like for me to do for you? <laughs> Politicians are smart, don't they, aren't they? Pilate's a smart, smart politician. He's used to giving the people something that they want in the course of a year, trying to appease them. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you Barabbas, or Jesus which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Uh, to envy is to desperately and even to a degree of sinfulness, typically, to want something that somebody else has. Jesus has power because he has a following, and the Jews have some power too. The issue is they don't quite have the following that he has. And so the corrupt leaders want for themselves what Jesus has. Pilate knows this. He also has looked at this man's life, and he realizes that even though he's been taken into custody, he's completely innocent of all charges. Now again, Pilate's not a great guy, but even an ungodly pagan ruler is willing to recognize the innocence of Jesus, and he desires to set him free. And so he asked them about this notable prisoner. I'm sure there were a lot of bad apples in the first century <laughs> Just like we have a lot of bad apples in the 21st century, but there's one bad apple in the first century that stands out above the others. He's more notorious than any other, and his name is Barabbas. This has led many Bible students to conclude that the likelihood is that this man uh, would have been the leader of what essentially is a first century gang. A bunch of rebels going against the government, willing to steal and to kill to get their way. If you look back in, in our own nation's history, there's something very similar to this. Uh, in the late 1800s, I'm sure you know about the James Younger gang. And, and as you look up on the screen, uh, you could probably, I say you meaning anyone, you could likely pick out a number of these names and maybe even some faces that strike a chord with, yeah, I recognize those guys. I'm sure that there are some history buffs here who would recognize and tell you something about each one of these individuals. But if I went around and, and took a poll, is there any one of these guys that just really stands out to you? One above the others? I guarantee you there would be 100% consensus in it. <laughs> It'd be Jesse, wouldn't it? He's the most notorious of the bunch. He's also the leader of the bunch. Well, in, in the first century James Younger gang, there was one who stood out from all the rest. You might be able to recognize if you lived in that time, all three of them, but everybody would recognize this one. He's the Jesse James of the first century. We're talking about Barabbas. He's the worst of them all. I think Pilate conscientiously chooses Barabbas, the very worst of all sinners, and to compare him to the guy who is completely innocent of all crimes because he thinks now, for nothing else, for shame purposes, the Jews are going to have their hand forced to choose Jesus to be set free over Barabbas. Boy, he grossly misunderstood the hatred of these people, didn't he, <laughs> toward Jesus. Well, it's nice to have a bride who seeks to help you out. And Pilate had that. Verse 19 of Matthew 27, While he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. When I first read over this text, I, I, I improperly jumped to a conclusion. I, I thought, well, maybe this lady has a, a nightmare that's sent to her uh, by God concerning Christ, and as a result of that, she has these bad headaches for the rest of the day, and maybe she's throwing up. <laughs> I don't think that's what's being stated. But, but notice where she has suffered. I have suffered many things this day in, in my dream because of him. I looked up the verb tense. It doesn't have anything with, with lingering effects associated with it. It's an aorist in Greek verb tense, same as our past tense, English. Action that began and was completed in the past. I, I think she's saying the suffering started in her dream and was completed in her dream. Obviously, she recalls what it is, but, but that's where the suffering took place. 
Uh, have you ever had a dream that someone's chasing after you and they're trying to beat you up? Uh, and finally, what feels like hours and hours is probably about 14 seconds in the dream. <laughs> they catch up to you and they start pummeling you and you wake up and maybe you, you've fallen off the bed and hit your head on the dresser or something. <laughs> uh, have you ever had a dream that, I hope not, but someone's trying to, to stab you or shoot you? Am I the only one that has crazy dreams? <laughs> These don't take place all the time. But every now and then I have some really weird dreams. When I was a kid, I had a dream someone was chasing me with a knife. And uh, they stabbed me in the side. And I, obviously, you know, I was smart enough, I was a pretty dumb kid, but I was smart enough to realize that I could bleed to death from this. And so in the dream, I pick my shirt up and blood just starts gushing out of my side. And I put my shirt down and the blood stops. Pick my shirt up, put it down. <laughs> Dreams never make sense, okay? <laughs> I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm, I'm good, apparently, until whatever uh, happens. Well, if you've ever had a, a dream and, and you've ever suffered anything and you, and you wake up and your heart's about to beat out of your chest and, and you're sweating, again, maybe you roll off your bed, you're flailing uh, about whenever you... It can really trouble you. Can't, this woman has had a dream, it appears, that has been sent to her from God in which the Lord has proclaimed to her the innocence of His Son, and apparently He warns her, you guys had better leave Him alone. And she's so bothered by it, she sends to her husband as he's sitting on his judgment seat trying to release Jesus anyway. And when this information comes to Pilate, he's probably not going to be that much more convinced. Yeah, we, we really do need to get rid of this guy. Not in a bad way, but in a good way and just release him because he's innocent of all charges. How fitting that the woman has a dream. You treat this man the wrong way and there are going to be severe consequences to pay for it. Brethren, I, admittedly, I, I don't know what suffering she had in, in her dream, but I can tell you this, whatever she dreamt, they pale in comparison to the sufferings that will have to be experienced for those who mistreat the Son of God. The Lord's trying to help them out, it appears, in this circumstance. Pilate's trying to release him. Verses 20 through 24 of Matthew 27, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Now, these aren't Roman politicians, but these are essentially Jewish politicians. Politicians have a slick way of going about business. And the Jews were no different than the Romans. They knew they had to convince the people, not of how wonderful Barabbas is, they couldn't do that, <laughs> but of how terrible the other guy is. I'll leave politics alone after this. <laughs> One more time. We, we ever see that in politics today? <laughs> it's not that this one's so good. It's that this one's so terrible, you can't have that one. <laughs> and sometimes it's right. But many times there's just an attempt to keep corruption in place. And that's the attempt of these Jews. They convince the multitudes to ask for the most vile criminal and to have handed over to be punished the most wonderful Savior. The governor answered, Whether of the twain or the two, will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas! Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, called the Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, a very important three-letter question in English, Why? Why would I do that? Why do you wish for that to be done? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. This is important. When Pilate saw that it, he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, Well, I'm innocent of the blood to this just person. You see to it. If only they would have answered that all-important question. Why? Evil never would have been performed. But because they refused to answer that simple logical question, the greatest evil ever been perpetrated took place. Folks, do you realize that for every evil that's committed, the reason for that is there's an unwillingness just to logically address the question, very simple, of why? I ask you, are we living any better than they? Are we willing to question why do we practice everything that we do or not practice everything that we don't? 
Why do we teach everything that we do or not teach everything that we don't? Why do we believe everything that we do or why do we not believe everything that we don't? Because if we'll just simply logically address that question, we will stay away from all wrongdoing. They were unwilling to do so. But essentially, you know what the answer is that they give to Pilate? Why? They really don't answer it, but they kind of sidestep it. And they all cry out together, crucify him. Essentially, what they're saying is, well, because we all agree. <laughs> There's always been comfort in numbers, hasn't there? And so they make the greatest and the worst switch ever made. When we're unwilling to address why, but instead we cry out, well, we all agree about it. Therefore, it must be right. Folks, we end up with Barabbas all over again instead of Christ. Pilate saw that a tumult was coming up. That's a rebellion. Does that sound familiar, by the way? <laughs> He's experienced this before. Back when he wanted to, to put in this pet water project, but he didn't have any way to pay for it, he just ignored what the Jews thought about it. And he did what he wanted, and that resulted in a revolt. He didn't want to have that type of thing again. And so when he sees that a rebellion is coming up, like what he's already experienced before, he's thinking, oh boy, how do I avoid this? Last time I just did what I wanted, and I ignored what the Jews thought. And so this time he ignores what he knows he ought to do, and he does what the Jews want done. He learned his lesson from the first time, but not in a good way for the second occasion. And he makes the worst switch ever made. Later, Peter speaks concerning this switch that took place in Acts 3, verses 13 through 15. Jesus, ye delivered up, and you denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And the consequence is you killed the Prince of Life. You know what a murderer is? By definition, it's someone who takes the life of another. I know there's a little more to it. Technically, unlawfully takes the life of another. Generally stated, a murderer is someone who takes the life of another. But then consider what Jesus is. The one who gives life to another. The complete opposite. You see what they've done for themselves? They've actually taken away life in Jesus so that they can have death, a murderer, a taker of life, in Barabbas. It'd be a lot like this. Uh, let's say, I hope this doesn't happen to you, but, but you're ill. You go to the doctor and you have some tests run, and you find out that you have this terrible infection in your bloodstream, but the doctor says, well, the good news is, you know, the medicine we have today, I know exactly what it'll take to fix it. He prescribes to you what you need. You go to the pharmacy, you pick it up, take these, and you're going to be just fine. You go home just happy as a lark. <laughs> but then you you talk to your neighbors about this and, and they say you know I'm not real sure about that medicine that the doctor gave you I wouldn't use that bottle if I were you and there are several neighbors that are in agreement and they say we have this bottle that we think you probably ought to use to be made well turns out it's just a bottle of poison they convince you well okay <laughs> and so you throw away the bottle that contains life for you and you take the bottle that contains death and you throw it back what happens to you doesn't matter what you thought was going to happen or what everyone else thought was going to happen. All that matters is what actually is really going to happen. You should have listened to the doctor who prescribed you life, huh? They should have listened to the doctor who was prescribing to them life. But instead, at the advice of their neighbors, they take the bottle of poison, they throw it back, and there you have it. Barabbas over Jesus. A murderer, a rebel, and a thief. What a terrible person Barabbas was. Hold on just a second there. Maybe we ought to think just a little bit more about this guy. The absolute worst of sin. I think Paul understood the significance of Barabbas when he wrote in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom Barabbas is chief. <laughs> That's not what he says, is it? He says, of whom I am chief. Folks, not only is Barabbas the worst of sinners, Paul's the worst of sinners. Peter's the worst of sinners. James is the worst of sinners. John is the worst of sinners. You are the worst of sinners. And I am the worst of sinners. It's true that that cross on Calvary's hill was made for Barabbas, but it wasn't made just for Barabbas, not the one in the middle. It was also made for Paul, for Peter, for James, for John, for you, and for me. That wasn't just Barabbas' cross. That was my cross, and that was your cross. 
But instead, Jesus went up on it, and he took all of the worst of sinners' places so the prospect is available that we don't have to go up there on that cross. However, that leaves two other crosses that are found, one to the left and one to the right of Jesus on the cross that should have belonged to Barabbas, that should have belonged to all these apostles, and should have belonged to you and me. What's the purpose of those two crosses to the sides of Jesus? Matthew 27, verses 38 through 44 say that two thieves were crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. They that passed by reviled him, wagging or shaking their heads, saying, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. The chief priests mocked him with the scribes and elders. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he really be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. Then we'll believe. Sorry, Dad. I think that's his lesson. <laughs> the only reason I bring it up, <laughs> I'm not trying to focus on the chief priest and, and the scribes. But the reason I bring it up, notice in verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. My focus is the crosses, okay? The thieves are on it, but I bring up these guys because the thieves said the same thing that these individuals did. And just briefly, I want to state this. They ask him to prove that he's really who he claims to be by coming down from the cross. However, the love of God shines through in, in this. Jesus knows that if he proves he's the Son of Man by coming down from the cross, then the sons of men have to go up on that cross. Jesus understands if he proves that he really is the king of Israel by coming down from the cross, then the subjects of the king have to go up on that cross. And more than wanting to prove himself right, he wants to give people the opportunity to be right with God. And so he does that instead. There's a song we sing in, in our congregation at Conway. You, you all may sing it in your home congregations. Uh, you, you probably heard it. If not, as you see before you, how deep the Father's love. Beautiful melody and even better words. The second verse of this song goes, Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Folks, very similar to the cross in the middle, I believe that's the significance of the crosses on either side of Jesus. I think you and I are also those two thieves that hung right beside him. Now, you might look at yourself and say, I've, I've never hurled incense, ver, uh, insults verbally at Jesus. Well, hopefully not. I hope you're that pious that you haven't done so. I bet many of us have. <laughs> but in the very least, every one of us has hurled insults at Christ by the way that we've lived and the sins that we've committed. Understand, we've mocked Christ by the way we live in the very least, just like those two thieves which hung on either side of Jesus. What did Christ think about this? If you're in your shoes, having all power at your disposal, people are making fun of you left and right, literally, as well as behind you and in front of you and below you. People are beating you senseless, and they're leaving their, you there hanging to die, and you have all power at your disposal. What would you do if you are in Christ's shoes, and what would you want? I wish I could say something more noble, but I'm afraid, I, truthfully, I'd probably want to get even with them and show them who I really was. But Luke 23 says in verses 33 and 34 that those who crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and, and the other on the left, Jesus said this. This is what's on his mind. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus isn't chasing punishment that all of them here deserve. Instead, he's pursuing forgiveness, and that's what he wants for everyone in this environment, including the thief on the left hand and the thief that's on his right hand. That's what he wants for everyone. Well, there's one thief who still doesn't get it, even though that's what Jesus wants. Luke 23, 39, one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. This is the challenge that he puts before Jesus. If you're really who you claim to be, first save yourself and then save us. He doesn't get it, does he? My kids and I, we're, we're watching uh, the Harry Potter series uh, right now. Maybe you've seen it before. We're, we're on movie, or episode, I should say, number five of eight. And so we have three left, which probably means we have about 16 movies left. <laughs> they're, they're really long. <laughs> There's a lot to see in them. Uh, really interesting stuff. But we just learned this in the Harry Potter uh, series. 
uh, that, that Harry, uh, in going uh, against his nemesis in Voldemort, he's just learned this through prophecy. Neither of us can live unless one of us dies. Unless one dies, neither can live. Very similar here in this situation, isn't it? The challenge that this criminal puts before Jesus, if you really are the Christ, save yourself and save us. We can all live. <laughs> He's about to find out salvation doesn't work that way. <laughs> Unless one of us dies, sir, then nobody here is going to be living. <laughs> and that one can only be Jesus. Thankfully, there's someone on the other side of Jesus who finally gets it, though. Verses 40 through 42 of Luke 23. The other answering rebuked him. Now that's different from what we read earlier. Rebuked him saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, would you be willing to remember me when you come into your kingdom? There are three interesting pieces of information we find out about this man's knowledge at this point. Number one, he believes in the steadily approaching kingdom of God, the church. Number two, he believes in Jesus, and Jesus is the focal point of that kingdom. And number three, he believes in the total innocence of Christ. When you go back and you compare those those positions to what John's ministry was, John the Baptist, he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not about me, but there's one coming greater than I. He's the focal point. In fact, look, he's right over there. And he's the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's interesting that, that this man is suffering for his crime in the very area where John was doing all of his teaching and his baptizing. Matthew 3, 5, and 6 says that Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan, this man, by the way, is just outside of Jerusalem suffering for his crime. He, he's in the center of all this activity. All Jerusalem, Judea, and the area around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him. Why? Luke 3, 3, for the forgiveness of their sins. The evidence is overwhelming. This man very likely, based on his knowledge and based on where he was living, was a wayward child of God who now regretted his sins and wanted to come back to his father. And so he asked, Jesus, King, I recognize you as that. <laughs> we're sinners. We have a reason we're dying here. You don't. You're completely innocent. I have my trust in you. Would you help me out in all these sins that I've committed? Can, can you help me to attain forgiveness and, and maybe to have just some sort of standing later on in your kingdom? I'm not sure that he understands everything about the kingdom, much like almost nobody did <laughs> at that time, but he has faith in Christ and he figures the rest. God will help him understand more in the future. Famous words of verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily, truly, or assuredly, you don't have to worry about anything, sir. I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. As we cast our minds back to Calvary, if you'll allow me to quote Randy Travis one more time, at the end of his song, Three Wooden Crosses, he says, there are three wooden crosses. Why there's not four of them? Now, I guess we know. Brothers and sisters, there is no need for four crosses on Calvary's hill. There only needed to be one in the middle for the worst of sinners, not just Barabbas' cross, but also Paul, Peter, James, John, your cross, and my cross. That Jesus said, no, I'm not going to have it. I'm going to take your place so you don't have to go up there. Nevertheless, those crosses that stood either side of the one found in the middle still have connection to you and me today. We're all thieves who've stolen the glory of God by leading sinful lives at one point or another. We're all murderers and that we've taken our lives when we had no right to do so through our sinful choices. We've all led rebellion against God, and so we're all guilty of insurrection. We're not only Barabbas, but we're also those two thieves that are found on the other side. But we see a difference between the two. As Jesus is on there, instead of wanting to give punishment to these guys that they're already receiving, 
He wants to give them what they don't deserve in forgiveness. But he leaves the choice up to them as to how they're going to handle the extension that's made to them. There's one on a certain side of Jesus. I'm not told which one, but there's one on a certain side of Jesus who never relents all the way to the end. But there's one who found on the other side who admits that he's a sinner and he's in need of a Savior. And as a wayward child of God, he asks for divine help and he receives it. Three crosses. The one in the middle belongs to every one of us. The other two represent us. The question is, which cross are we going to choose? I thank uh, Brother Derek for another wonderful lesson. Uh, we've already had two lessons here this morning. I do, would make, make one, recommend, one recommendation for Brother Derek, that he may want to change his bedtime routine, and so maybe some of those dreams will change for you. <laughs> anyway.